Nikki Reese, how are you doing? Great. Great. Fantastic. So, fantastic. Great. Great. It's nice to hear about people being, being well right now in those uh, strange well, times, both in the world and especially in the, the US of A right now. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sick. I don't, I don't think I'm sick. So Good. Good. Go you know, you never know. You could be sick. Every, every day it could be different, you know. How has the COVID have any impact on your work? Were you amongst the filmmakers who had to stop production or was it, were you in between uh, shoots so you could work on a uh, on project? Well, I finished uh, shooting a movie in, oh, I'm sorry, shooting a movie in January and then COVID hit in like March. So I was already in the, you know, knee deep in editing and, um, So the only thing it's affecting now is I'm trying to get another project going and I literally wrote it to be smaller and I'm asking for less money because I want to shoot it during COVID, um, you know, and uh, just have a very small crew, like a skeleton crew and a skeleton cast even, uh, you know, kind of more of a chamber movie. And um, That's the only thing that I found is that it's it's affecting me when I'm talking to financiers and stuff about getting the project off the ground. You know, everybody's a little uh, insecure about throwing money at a movie right now for yeah. a good reason, you know, because productions keep getting shut down. So basically, I'm like, I guarantee you this won't get shut down, but I can't guarantee it. You know, someone could get sick. I don't know. But I mean, we're trying to keep it really, really small, 15 to 20 people at the max you know, in a room at one time. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. A lot of, uh, of people in the film industry have been saying that uh, with the COVID going on and all the, the, the safety measures that needs to be, uh, to be uh, taken for granted when you make a film, uh, this would mark the return of indie films with small crews. And as I was working on, on our interview, I, I thought, well, isn't that what Nikki Reese has been doing since the beginning? Yeah, I don't know any better. I don't know what it's like. So yeah, me saying that I'm, you know, made a movie for COVID that we could do like, you know, you know, uh, with a small crew. Yeah, basically, I'm just talking about everything. Yeah. Um, you know, like Climate of the Hunter would have been a very safe movie to shoot during COVID because we were all in, uh, we had three different cabins and no one ever left the set and we were there for two weeks and there was only there was never more than you know 10 to 15 people there at one time so that would have been a very covid safe movie so basically i'm taking that just thinking like well i can do that again you know and under and then hopefully have a movie out in in a pond of movies as opposed to a sea of movies since a lot of people aren't working right now climate of the hunter in a way is your breakthrough film like people are finally Uh, being more, more people are uh, discovering your work, but it's all going online. I mean, you had a screening at, at Fantastic Fest and then the COVID happened a few months later. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you're mentioning how you're giving more interviews right now. Uh, how do you feel about not maybe discovering uh, the, uh, uh, well, what we could call the, 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 fe the international festival circuit to its fullest potential. So, not being so, able to travel with your film. Oh, not being able to travel? Oh my God, well, it sucks. Yeah. Um, you know, because, you know, you don't make a movie to screen online, you make a movie to show in a theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I don't even know what people are watching. You know what I mean? Whenever they're seeing the movie uh, at home or, or on a computer, you know, especially like, you know, uh, a movie with a. Uh, with a low profile like this, you know, being that like, it's more of a discovery. Well, it, I don't know what they're even seeing, what their experience is because I'm not in the theater with them. Uh, pretty much all of your movies have played in local festivals, local events and bars or in, uh, during music, uh, music concert, if I understand. So yeah. you're not in a position where you can, you can tell this is how the Boston audience uh, reacts to Climate of the Hunter. This is how the Montreal audience reacts. So, yeah, it must be... Well, you can still get it through social network, but actually it's not the same thing. The, the flip side of that coin is, though, that you have, uh, you're, you have so many more press outlets that are able to see your movie because they can watch it on their own time. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so there's more... I feel like there's more press seeing it 
than, or more people in general, really. I mean, because press are just the only ones writing about it, you know, I mean, you'll have Letterboxd and Twitter, but you have to take Letterboxd and, or, or Twitter, somebody uh, talking about it on social media and then, you know, multiply that because who knows how many people are watching it and then not saying anything about it. But as far as where, like, uh, you know, reviews and stuff have come in, like, press-wise, like, clearly more people are watching it than I think would be watching it if it, if it were at a physical festival. Yeah, especially if, you, well, you know what it is uh, at a film event like that, if you have the choice between seeing something you never heard of or uh, going with a, a movie directed by uh, an established filmmaker, chances are you, I mean, some cinephiles will prefer to go with the discovery, but uh, most people will, will go with, uh, you know, the new Scorsese or the new, or the new Lynch. I'm one of those people. I would, <laughs> I would go, <laughs> I would go see the director I like, that's to go see their movie, you know, underground as, you know, as I am and when, you know, the kind of uh, what I make, like, uh, I'm not, my, my sensibilities aren't necessarily in line with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not, to check out the like you know the coolest deepest cuts that i can yeah yeah I, do them, I usually enjoy them i'm usually very inspired by them but i don't seek them out somehow it doesn't fit in or uh on the uh the id a lot of cinephiles have on underground cinema as if it's it's usually underground cinema usually mean like either very experimental movies or um uh, very violent horror films yeah it was always just a matter of like trying to do something that is to stand out that is wild um and also that's just that's where where i lie as a filmmaker what i want to do that's just what i'm interested in is doing something that no one's ever seen before so would you say that um you've I'm never trying now to be more commercial i'm trying i can't do it <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, I am trying, I'm legitimately trying to work with bigger budgets and try to do something just so I can like grow as a filmmaker, not even profile wise, but you know, uh, more money I have, the more like tricks I can do, the more stuff Ooh. I can do, the more stuff like I can um, emulate from my heroes, you know, and, uh, and try to do something that's actually could earn a place in cinema history. Right. right. You know? Well, yeah. Well, I, I think your films have a place in, in, in film history for being so, so unique. It, 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 what's, what truly grabbed my, my attention when I, when I discovered your films, I started with, with Climate of the Hunter, then moved to, to Alien. And um, I, 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 I watched Broadcast yesterday, which I, which I loved. I love that film. I hope we can talk about it uh, uh, later. Um, but even now, we can see uh, clear references in your film. Like we, could, I, I'm pretty sure that a, a lazy film critic could go, uh, "T-Rex is your Robert Altman homage. Climate of the Hunter is your vampire film." Uh, what makes them truly unique is there are so unique. I have never seen anything like your films. I, it, they truly seem to be coming from nowhere. Well, I have, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's just the, the, the Tarantino formula, you know what I mean? Or, or really a lot of uh, Scorsese even like everybody that just, you know, you're just crafting like certain scenes and you're ripping off of something, you know, uh, or taken from something. And then, and of course it always ends up as, you know, you can rip off a, a filmmaker, to a T and it's always going to end up looking like something different because you just don't, you're not that person. Um, so it's just kind of like every scene I see, it's always thinking about uh, another movie, you know, that I've, that I've seen that I, that I like, Ooh, Oh, this scene. Oh, I know how we, we can do this scene. We can do this scene. Like uh, Michael Mann's the insider. Here's how we do it, you know? And, uh, and I'm just guessing. And, and, and it's also, also like how I remember it. So not directly imitating, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes it would happen that you would uh, rewatch a film and you're like, oh yeah, that scene is totally coming from uh, Pulp Fiction or, uh, or Eyes Wide Shut, for example. Uh, sure. It's, it, so it's not fully, uh, you're not always fully conscious of how uh, your cinephilia uh, builds itself into your work. Yes, 100%. So 
you wouldn't say that your film are like a, a, a simply a collage of scenes you like. There, there, there's more of yourself into it. Yeah, and also, you know, a lot of it becomes, uh, you know, unique and original because it, out of necessity, like T-Rex was uh, supposed to be a movie called Goldie Had a Nervous Breakdown. And wow. it starts out with the, uh, the date at the beginning of T-Rex, the date that they're on at that little steakhouse. Uh, it was basically her movie. And then like uh, scheduling conflicts happened and she had to drop out. And I was like, well, we already have this footage and, and we're already like started this movie. Because at that time, you know, you're not, you're not paying anyone because there's no money involved in the damn movie all, at all. So you just got to kind of work with on a whim. So it was like, all right, well then we already got this scene and this scene. Let's just uh, explore some other characters. We'll make it, we'll make this like shortcuts or Magnolia and just go to a bunch of different characters be just because like we've already got this footage. So it was never even like 100% from the get go, like planned out to be a movie like that. It just became a movie like that. Right. So would you agree that, uh, except maybe with Climate of the Hunter, you, you, you were never really able to fully plan a movie in advance? that there would always be, you would all, you're always aware that at some point, maybe an actor would not be available on a, on a shooting day and you had to think of something else. Uh, Strike, which, Climate, and Agnes, which no one's seen yet, but uh, yeah, those are the three movies that have been, that were like kind of planned to a T and actually worked out. And how, how does, did you feel like some kind of a, uh, a change in uh, in the way you would create. Like I'm assuming that before then, like when you uh, when you made T Rex, uh, a lot of room was left to intuition. Like if something doesn't work out, if you cannot shoot a scene, well, you you just follow. Um, okay, let's do this instead. Uh, where how did you feel to work in a more uh, 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 rigid uh, in a more rigid way? So in T Rex, you know, it was just me and a camera or Tarsus, I mean, any of those movies, it was just me and a camera. So there was no, there was no one else to coordinate with other than actors. Um, so when movies like Strike and uh, Climate and, uh, and Agnes, like they are, you're coordinating with so many other people, so many other crew, you got makeup and wardrobe and production design and all that stuff. So um, and a, a DP, uh, sound guy even you know what I mean like stuff I never had before so it kind of had to be uh, more um, more structured just because there's so many other people around at stake and then yeah of course it was hard a little bit because I'm like ooh, like it's normally it'd be me and my camera and I'd be like ooh, I'm gonna get this real quick here let's do this let's do this real quick and everybody just there's only me and some actors so we can do that real quick but then you know when you have a whole crew of people and you just want to go film a a bug on a tree, you know, it becomes a big ordeal. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that and it's, and it just requires more patience working with the crew, but the movie ends up looking, looking better and cooler and you get some of your ideas out uh, more clearly than you would if, if, uh, if I was just working by myself. Right. I heard a story that uh, Terrence Malick is both a, a perfectionist, but someone who loves uh, what um, uh, coincidence and what cannot be planned on a film shoot. And supposedly that during the Tin Red Line, all this crew spend the entire day on a single shot, let's say, of a soldier lying down. And because it's Malik, they move the herb, they move everything, light isn't good, change the light. And as they're ready to shoot, Malik look, hears something, looks, looks up, and he sees a monkey on a tree, and he, he just tells his cameraman, film that monkey right there. And Malik being Malik, the crew probably just went, okay. <laughs> yes, my bug on a tree comment was definitely in reference to Malik. Um, you know, there's also, I, I, I think it's more like, uh, like Herzog, like Strozek, uh, where, you know, you have this movie, you have this character that you're following, and then the character gets on um, the little ski lift, we hear like a gunshot or whatever, but really at that point, uh, Werner's more interested in just, you know, filming that chicken dance. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like he just, he, he was like, we made this whole movie, but then I found something even more interesting when we got into that, that little uh, fun house with the, with the rabbit and the duck and the chicken. And so that's always like inspired me too. of just like, see, he does it. Like <laughs> yeah. he gets inspired by something and he goes to shoot. It doesn't matter what the script said. It doesn't matter what's, you know, because writing something and filming something are just two totally different things. Um, you're always going to find something better on the day. Would, was there still room left for improvisation in uh, Dear Mistress and Climate of the Hunter? Or was that completely impossible because of the, those new conditions you had to work with? No. I mean, yeah, there, there was not much improvising on that stuff. But I think that's my fault. I think that's just me not having um, the experience. I have the experience to improvise if it's just me and some actors. Right. Uh, I don't really know, I don't really have it figured out so much how to work with the crew and the actors and improvise yet, but I'll get there. I mean, I feel like, you know, even some of the, the best directors don't really have that, you know, like Scorsese does it, but he's fucking Scorsese. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I, I think I just need more experience with crews because uh, while I've made a bunch of movies, I haven't made a bunch of movies with, with crews. So, you know, it's all kind of a new, like, new learning experience. It's a new stage in my filmmaking. How, how was your first day on, on a set with a crew, considering you've, as you said, you've made so many movies before? I mean, I was just like, what's taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, I think I was very impatient the first time. And then on the last one, I think I was more patient. And I think on the next one, I'll be even more patient, especially, you know, it takes longer now. I can't just pump them out. I can't just pump out two or three a year. You know, it's more like one a year, and so I'm like, you know, jonesing for it the, the whole year. So whenever I get there, I'm kind of more appreciative, more thankful when I'm there. Would Would you eventually like to do uh, something like uh, like what uh, Steven Soderbergh does, which is he always seems to alternate between big productions and smaller movies? Like, uh, are you done with films you just do on your own? Yeah, I mean, Agnes had like three times the budget as climate. And now I'm trying to go somewhere in between that. So I think, yeah, so the, but then after that, maybe I'll want to do a, a bigger movie. So, you know, yeah, I think definitely I'll go, I'll alternate, alternate between projects, doing big and small. Um, I like, uh, I, I think the small movies will kind of, I, every time, when I was on the set of Agnes the whole time, I was like, man, I really want to make a smaller movie after this. Um, just because you kind of get to recharge your batteries mm -hmm. um, and figure out, you know, what you, I don't know, what you like. Uh, and, and you get to grow more and you get to grow more on big movies too, but it, there's a lot of pressure and I like to do it without the pressure. So yeah, I will totally go back and forth and do big movies and small movies. Yeah. And just to keep on working, I, I, I've always been felt weird about, uh, filmmakers who who just sit around and wait to have a new movie get in, into production, especially today when everyone has access to a camera, anyone can make a movie. It's it's much more easier than it used to uh, in uh, in the eighties. I mean, I I, I think wanna, you, they want they want to wait because they want to get uh, you know more money because they don't want to make a pile of garbage. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've made a lot of movies, but I've made a lot of fucking garbage, you know? So, and of course, people don't want that. People don't want to have a bunch of garbage. To me, I don't care. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to make garbage now. I don't want to go make a movie like uh, Suede Head now, but I want to go make a movie like Climate now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like, I still want to do small movies. I just, I don't want to go that small. Right, yeah. But I mean, where it was just like, just because I have different sensibilities now, I'm, it was, that was, you know, it was learning. It was like film school, like learning. So, um, so if I was to do Suede Head, I would, again, a movie like that, I would do, um, you know, I would do it, but I would have lighting and sound. Right. You know, I, I mean, yeah. that would be a difference. And food, we would eat. <laughs> Everybody would be comfortable. So I'm not saying the material, material wise, I would go remake any, any of those movies. I would make movies like that all day long. I'd make whatever kind of fucking movie there is like material wise. I'm just mm -hmm. saying like, 
production wise, like I'm spoiled now. I need a little bit more money. Yeah, I I, I felt that with broadcast you have a, a great storyline for an eventual, and I'm, I'm going to use a big H word here, the Hollywood version of that film. It seems that, that all the elements are there for a, a, an eventual remake. Is that something yeah. you ever consider, remaking smaller movies you've made eventually? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we want to remake The Writer and the Monster. I talked about it in that documentary, Belle Isle. It's the movie with the guy that's covered in shit. And then the writer comes and like visits him uh, to get to like write his memoirs or whatever. I mean, we've been talking about that for a while, wanting to remake that movie, but who's going to give us money to make a movie about a guy covered in shit. You know, the struggle is not worth the, <laughs> what we would actually do that. But once we, you know, at some point, eventually, whenever, I, hopefully if I get, you know, more power as a filmmaker, so more like where people would be willing to throw us, you know, 50 to 100 grand or something because that's what i'm saying like you know something like a small budget still to make that movie but knowing that it's probably not going to do anything <laughs> when it comes out you know probably just go straight to streaming and like four people would watch it and then other people would just be like that's disgusting i don't want to see a guy covered in shit but yeah we talked about remaking that movie but it, like i said it just hasn't happened yet i'm still kind of working my way up the ladder to where I can get funding easier for projects that I love. Do you, do you find it difficult to get into that game? Like the, 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 the more, like let's say the, the official film industry uh, way of making movies, of basically getting into the film industry. And maybe can you tell me how, how it happened? How, how it began, how, how Climate of the Hunter came out to be? So, uh, you know, all the movies had been done with just me and uh, a micro microphone on top of the camera, a DSLR camera with a microphone on top of it. And then, um, and then someone asked me, hey, it was, it's Kate Jones who starred in, um, uh, she was Priscilla Presley in Mickey Reese's Alien. She's in broadcast, she's in a bunch of movies. And uh, she said, what do you want to make next? And I was like, well, I want to make this Elvis movie, but I would need money for that. I would need a little more, more money for that because I'd need to hire a crew because I'd want to make it cinematic as opposed to like the mumblecore style that I'd been working under at that time. Um, and, uh, and she was like, well, let's do a crowdfunding campaign. So we did a crowdfunding campaign. We did not make the money, but we got resources. And it was like, okay, it looks like we can do this. Let's do it. So we only had about four grand on that movie, but we had resources. We had a sound guy that said he wanted to do it. Um, I hired my friend Joe Kappa to be the DP. And um, anyway, it was okay. So I'm, I'm getting there. That's, I'm taking a long way around. So we made that movie. We did it. Uh, we premiered at our local festival and then won the festival. Um, so then we got more notoriety around here. But at that time, I had already. Um, got another movie funded. Strike Your Mistress was funded by the time we premiered uh, Mickey Reese's Alien. And then um, we did a bunch of regional festivals with that, just all the festivals that we could get into and which weren't many, like, which is, you know, surprising now that like that movie got panned like so hard at festivals. Like it seems like, yeah, I don't know. Um, but then then I had Strike Your Mistress funded and Peter Kaplowski saw Mickey Reese's Alien, reached out to me and said, um, hey, uh, I want to help you with your movies. So if you have something, um, your next movie, I can't do anything with uh, your Elvis movie because it's already premiered, but I can do something with your next movie. So let me know what it is. And I was like, all right, well, I'm almost done. <laughs> like, I'm, almost, I'm like, I've already shot it. I'm almost done with it. Uh, here's a trailer. And he's like, cool. And then I sent him the movie. And then we were going to premiere it at that same local festival because a lot of the local, a lot of it were local investors. So we thought, well, we needed to show them like a big premiere. And that's all we knew at the time. We didn't have any uh, resources to get any other kind of bigger festival. And we knew it would just get fucking panned like Alien did, where you send it to all these festivals and they're just like, we don't like this bullshit, whatever the hell this movie is. Just no frame of reference for it, which I think that they judge on like quality as opposed to, you know, what's what what's actually happening in the movie. Like, I think a lot of like, 
to reach those ladders in a film festival when you're submitting just blindly. I think they're just looking at like, well, this didn't cost a million dollars. Next. Yeah. I, I, um, as someone who used to be a programmer, I can, I can attest that they look a lot at what we call production values. Exactly. And that's terrible for filmmakers because some, like yourself, manage to make great movies but because they don't look like something that could play at Sundance, it doesn't have the, 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 the Sundance look, they won't even bother with it after five minutes, they're going to turn it off. Right. So, and I, I, um, I think that one, one conse- consequences of that is how uh, uh, the, the small indie movies, just like Alien, and I agree with you, it's truly unfair that this film didn't get more festival recognition is a uh, true underground cinema are now invisible. It's all about just like maintaining a certain status. Exactly. Um, which whatever, that's fine. So, um, so then we have Strike Your Mistress and we we're going to premiere at that festival, but then Peter said, don't premiere it at the festival. I'm going to get it into a bigger festival. Well, months pass and I'm panicking. I don't even know this guy. I've only talked to this guy <laughs> on the phone. And, you know, met him through email. I'm just like, this could be this. That could have been, this could have been a ruse the entire time. I should have gone with my gut. Very, you know, very just like, oh, no, oh, no. And then, then he got us into Fantastic Fest. I didn't know what Fantastic Fest was. Really? But I looked at it and I was like, ooh, there would be blood premiered there? I've heard <laughs> of that movie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so then we did Fantastic Fest. And then, you know, he kind of like centered around, like Peter, you know, Peter did it all. Uh, he, you know, he's responsible for all, everything, but like he, um, you know, wrote a story about it. He wrote it, he, he, he turned it into a story where it was like, where it gives you a frame of reference to watch this low, no budget movie. Um, and then, and, and, and you're able to enjoy it because, you know, there's a story behind it. This, you know, me have been making so many movies, all yeah. this time, yada, yada, and just never got the, uh, the spotlight never never got like a platform um so then after that then he introduced me to then we got divide and conquer on board and they uh helped us uh raise money for climb of the hunter and then directly after that we got uh agnes they uh hooked us up with some uh with another production company called quagmire and, and so we did agnes and so um and that's obviously the biggest budget i've worked on to date and uh it was you know it was a lot big big learning curve and uh but i mean it's a it's a good movie and i'm excited for it to come out um but and maybe you would have already seen it now maybe it would have already been out but covid would you agree that maybe because there are so many movies being made right now being submitted and being submitted to festivals that uh an, an indie filmmaker needs to brand himself or herself in order to gain attention well, I don't know, because I mean, I only know my path, you know, and I don't think any, I don't think anybody should ever take my path. No one should ever just, you know, make movies and make movies until the industry catches up with you, because it took a long time. And I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I've done it all this time. You know, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just making movies because I like doing it. Um, so, I mean, so you can't really instill that in anyone. That just has to happen. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I imagine there's some world where, you know, you go to film school and then you work on a couple movies and then you, uh, network and then get to make your own movie. And then that's your, you know, that's your in. Um, and that sounds like a much easier way than what I, the way I went about it. So as far as, but as far as like branding, it just, I don't know, it depends on, I didn't ever mean to be a, a brand or, you know what I mean? I never meant to be like a, 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 a name filmmaker or something that like we're gonna we're gonna fund your movie based on you know just whatever movie you're gonna make or or we're gonna see your movie based on just whatever just because we're fans we're gonna see whatever movie we're gonna make I was always just trying to make the movies so I think if it was intentional of someone that it might ring false it's interesting (laughs) never had to answer a question like that before no Uh, no I I think it's a fair answer I have a friend who uh, maybe you've heard of her Maddie Doe she is the first female filmmaker from Laos, which is a small Asian country near Vietnam. And she doesn't know how to feel about it because it's, 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 
it's a lot of uh, it gets her a lot of attention because that is that is something that is a title you can use obviously to approach producers investors but it yeah. also comes with its share of responsibilities because you're the she is the first woman making movies in, in, in the entire history of the country well that sounds like a lot more pressure than what i gotta deal with so. <laughs> but i mean yeah she can use that to uh, her advantage to uh, talk to uh, investors and and you know get and further her career but i mean it's not even about furthering your career it's about getting more money to establish cooler ideas on the screen um then great you know mm -hmm. what i mean like that's so i it, it works out it works out for a lot of people in that way i don't really i don't i try to um only approach investors or 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 let investors in and talk to investors at all if they already know who i am mm -hmm. Because if they don't, it's just the most confusing, awkward conversation, just the weirdest thing, you know what I mean? Because where do you start? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, w I, was gonna, I, I was gonna ask you that, like what would be the best initiation to, to, well, to your I, filmography? Well, that, no, that documentary. Yeah. Belial, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's what it's for. Someone says like, "Hey, I've got an investor that's interested, um, and they they want to see like a a lookbook or, or or something like something that like like I, I'm not trying to sell projects anymore. I'm trying mm -hmm. to cultivate a uh, a family of people, investors, producers, and things like that that are just going to that we're all going to just continue to make whatever we're going to make next. You know what I mean? And try not to uh, it's." Yeah, like I said, it's just difficult to bring uh, outsiders, like investors in that don't already know the drill. Uh, well, a lot of people will be able to uh, know your work now is the Mickey Reese collection that uh, is available, currently available on, on the Alamo Draft House uh, uh, video platform. How did you choose the films uh, that would become a part of it? Well, I mean, I knew it was going to be the last three before Climate and Agnes, so Arrows, Alien, and Strike. So that was a no-brainer. I was, and I knew, and T-Rex was my favorite. Um, and then Tarsus was the only, was Tarsus and Swedehead, those were like, those were just my favorite. Those were my favorite ones. And then Tarsus, um, uh, well, we didn't get to go up there. <laughs> um, there was, uh, just some people that didn't want it to, to have that. Like I can still, I mean, it's still my movie, and I can still show it, uh, you know, at a in a theater or something, or do something like that. But they didn't really. There was some actors that weren't actors in it, and they were doing some things that they don't know if they needed that it would help their professional career now. So mm. it was kind of like that situation where it was like, all right, so out of respect, just like, all right, we won't. We won't put that one up there, but you know, that's, that was the original six. And so, because there wasn't a sixth one I wanted to put on there, I guess it would have been broadcast, but I didn't want to do that because it was just too normal. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, cause it was made to be kind of like what you said, like the more ho Hollywood movie. Yeah. So that's why I put together the documentary because I, I knew it would just be so random and it was just kind of like, uh, whenever people had a frame of reference for Strike Your Mistress, then they were able to watch it differently. Mm -hmm. So I thought making that documentary before you watch the other five movies that were on in that package, um, you know, if you start with Belle Isle, then you can um, figure out, you know, how to watch the rest of the movie. It, it informs you of how to watch the rest of the movies. Yeah, no, of course. But also, if, uh, if anyone truly pays attention to... Uh to the movies and the collection, as well as the rest of your filmography, um, at some point, uh, you quickly start to notice um, patterns, recurring scenes and themes, even on the, even on the films that are quite different. Like, for example, you seem to have uh, an obsession with awkward dates. Yeah. Well, there's one in Sweathead. There's a uh, uh, T-Rex opens with with <laughs> with one in a way. Uh, the one in Sweathead with the, the the conversation about Transformers Four is 
very very funny there's something about dates and broadcasts as well like she's being offered to go to she well she she ends up going to to one with that friend who never called uh, with that with that guy who never calls her back the, yeah, yeah. is it is it something you it seems like you never notice it yourself uh well that ele that element but or well it's always you know it's like because uh in those movies i'm uh working with the camera with the mic on top of the camera i've always got to keep it inside somewhere mm -hmm. oklahoma the wind it's unbelievable people call chicago the windy city oklahoma is just constant just <laughs> all the time so you can't shoot outside so that's why i had to shoot people talking in rooms and that's that's where that comes from because i didn't have any other choice i had a mic on top of a camera so uh you know if you're able to get access to a restaurant or a bar well that's a new room and then what's the best scenario you can have going on in there well a date so it was kind of more like that than it is some kind of like because i i haven't even been able to really like tap into what i'm into as far as themes and stuff go because i've always been working on such a low budget so i don't ever i can't write a script and just expect it to be made like that so i don't even know what um what my what what i'm what my sensibilities are in in as a writer because i'm always writing for something that's that can be shot yeah and also i i guess you would agree with me that you're interested in uh awkward characters and what better ways to show their, their awkwardness than through the the ritual of a date where you try to impress the other you try to hide uh, uh, parts of yourself you don't really want to show. Uh, sure. No one is no one is really them uh, in, in self or herself during a date. But this is where a, a, a side still manage to show up. I love the uh, awkward date in a uh, punch drunk love. Yeah, yeah. Where, where he's sitting there with with uh, Emily Watson and uh, he's talking about that radio that radio show that he that he listens to and she's like. Uh, like, I don't know, I don't know what she says, like, your sister said blah, blah, blah. And he's like, my sister is a liar. <laughs> like, I love that scene. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really have anything to tie in personally or anything. I don't go on awkward dates or anything. I don't even remember last time I went on a date. I've been on some dates. I guess I've been on some awkward dates, but I don't ever think about that in, like, when I'm writing a scene or something, it's just kind of like, this is what this character needs to do now. It's more like invent the character and then the movie writes itself. Right. Uh, so would you say that your, your, your films are not inspired that much by, uh, from people, you know, um, cause there's a few like, like broadcast, well, broadcast is based, that one is based on a true story. Or well, there was some article that I read about a uh, woman who, uh, that someone took pictures of a woman who uh, went and just dumped her dog out in the middle of a field and then posted it on social media and then, and then it got to, you know, became newsworthy and blah, blah, blah. So I just, that's the, that was the true story. That's right. all that happened. So all the rest of it was just kind of filling in the blanks. I think it, oh, it's American Hustle that begins with some of this actually happened. Yes, yes. And exactly. what what is real and is not real. Uh, but back to, uh, back to uh, character writing. Uh, so you're not inspired by people, you know, uh, or like the, when you choose an actor to play a specific role, you don't, do you think that this is uh, uh, like, you need someone who's angry all the time, like the lead character in Sue Head, you didn't get the, uh, a friend who is himself. Uh, oh no! That, complete no. anger. I, in fact, I do the opposite. I try to take someone I like as an actor, and then try to give them like a challenge. So, right. Yeah, Mason is um, a just like this. He's like my side. He's he's like, oh, okay. So Mason is in Arrows of Outrageous Fortune. He's like mm -hmm. the blonde guy, Jerry. You know what I mean? So that's oh. more. Yeah, that's more like him in real life. Right. Just like kind of like a fun guy, like, hey, I'm Mason. How's it going, guys? So then, because I wanted to work with him, it was like, all right, you're gonna dye your hair black, you're gonna be goth, and you're gonna be pissed off the whole movie. You know what I mean? So it was more about creating a, a character than it was like trying to base on someone I know. 
Like, I, yeah, so in that vein, I don't really get personal with the movies because I've seen it. I've seen that. I've seen people um, in their, in, like, filmmakers in their 20s or 30s that, like, are, are making movies with, you know, people in their 20s and 30s. Or, um, or like, they're at a college party or, you know, it's always, or they're at a bar or something. It's always based on something that they know. And I like to do something, um, you know, I like to make a movie about nuns or, yeah. or, or vampires, you know what I mean? Like something that's uh, very far removed from me and then I can put myself into it. Yeah, or I, like making a, 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 a what, how, how could we describe it? A sci-fi biography on Elvis. Yeah, well, yeah, it was about, yeah, I just I wanted to make an Elvis movie, <laughs> you know? Why Elvis? Do what? Why Elvis? Why oh, you... um, the, uh, the imagery. <laughs> Like I was, I was fascinated by what the cinematography would look like in, a, in like a black and white Elvis movie. I was like, that's, he's just such an iconic looking character. I was just kind of like, man, that'll really look nice in the frame. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, let's just see if we can piece all the rest of it around it. Uh, so I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not a fan of Elvis or anything. Really? Um, I mean, I'm a fan of Elvis the way anybody's a fan of Elvis, you know. Uh, but I just thought he was a very I iconic looking figure and I wanted to. Uh, do something like that um or do some do something with him and you know the original actor i had wasn't uh, it was actually written for uh, an actor a friend of mine named dustin sanchez and then he couldn't do it so i had to cast um and actually dustin looked more like elvis jacob snobble looks nothing like elvis but i said it doesn't matter hair and makeup yeah. will do that job um so yeah it was like that and just trying to make kind of like an ed wood like goth movie yeah. out of elvis i guess yeah that, was, that was the idea because because even though the film is uh refers to uh real events in the king's life it, it never tries to be f fully factual like if someone would want to learn about elvis he should definitely not watch alien it's more about the cultural figure is placed in or in, in pop culture Yeah, and that, and you know, it, it, the visuals came first on it. It was never, I never imagined what it, what, what the story was, what the writing entailed. Um, but then, like, oh, we're going to do this Elvis movie. I got to, uh, I guess I got to write a script for it. And so in the script, that stuff just kind of came to me while I was writing it, just like what this actually is, what this actually stands for. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, be, it became more interesting than I had imagined originally. That, yeah. that it never would um in, in what in what the movie represents and the, the the themes do you do you consider that history is kind of a is kind of a playground and for writers like you can basically do whatever you want with it the uh, artists have that freedom to reinterpret um yes because like even when you have someone that's trying to do something traditional that's actually trying to like tell the story they're still making it up Yeah, there's no way they knew what ha what was like being said in those rooms at that time. You know, they're still making it up. They're still making a story out of it. So, um, so yeah, why not just make up something absurd? And um, what what about uh, going back to to uh, to climate of the hunter? Uh, because in this one, you use a, a an another uh, cultural figure, which is a vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, but in in very in very surprising ways like if it if someone would uh this like if we take that adventurous cinephile who decides to see a film he never heard of at a festival and goes okay climate of the hunter i'm i'm going for this one and doesn't read anything about it uh, it takes a while before you figure out it is a film with with uh, those creatures of the night and that i think that is something that uh we can find in your writing is you definitely take the time to establish your story uh like broadcast for example i feel that the the broadcast element the fact that she starts to do her own uh, uh, news show it comes late into the film and I, i i feel that in an hollywood production that would have already have that would already begin 20 minutes in while in broadcast I, I, it's almost 40 or something like that yeah Like what do you what about it? What's the question? Well, I I, I feel that you uh, you really take your time in in, in exploring uh, uh, your narrative 
you you don't follow the 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 the, uh, no. the writing well, rules of at 15 minutes you need this and at yeah, yeah. Well, you need it's because this. that uh, it's because I'm writing the characters and the and like I said before like you know you you come up with an interesting character then the movie writes itself well the movie writes itself but that doesn't necessarily mean that the movie writes itself formulaically or that it that it that you're still I don't I don't know because I don't I've never taken a screenplay class or anything I've never read a screenplay book. I don't want to. It's not interesting to me. Like the, that, you know, like you have to, these are, or th this is what works. You know what I mean? You, you yeah. do this structure and this is what works like that. I would never, you know, think about that when I'm like writing a screenplay. I'm just trying to get the characters talking, you know, you get this character with this character and this character and like, Ooh, let's throw in this character. And then this is just what they say. Yeah. You know? And uh, the only thing that motivates me to take them outside of one room into the other is visuals. And you also take the, you also break uh, one rule I, I've learned way too often in film school myself, uh, which is to break the tone. And I'm, I'm talking about Harrow's, the final act, which you're like, they're do, uh, we're not going to spoil it, but there is a surprise ending. Uh, the, but, oh, for Arrows, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you're like, what? what? They're doing what? But it works in the universe you create. It, it makes sense that those characters would do that, but there is absolutely nothing uh, clearly leading up to this. If there was a, uh, something leading up to that, then it wouldn't be a surprise. That, yeah, exactly, exactly. But I, I feel like a snob uh, uh, film school teacher would say, you can't do that in a movie. Well, you can. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, <laughs> So this, it was a situation like this. I was like, I was thinking, I was looking at, it was an overview of the movie, thinking about what it was and what was happening in the movie. And you know, you know the movie the way, you know the, the way the movie was supposed to end because you've seen that movie before. Oh. You know what I mean? You've yeah. seen Arrows before. Up until that last scene, you've seen that movie. You know how it's going to end. You know how everything's going to resolve or not resolve or whatever. You've seen that movie. There's nothing different. So I was like, what am I even doing? You know, because it's like, we were doing this for fun. We didn't have any money. It was between uh, strike and climate. And we were just having fun. We wanted to shoot a movie and it was taking too long to, to get money to make a movie. So we we're like, um, fuck that. We're just going to, you know, make a movie for free with our friends for fun. Um, that's what we did. And um, why do I need to uh, obey any rules in that scenario when it's just whatever we want to do, you know, we're just having fun shooting the movie. So why, why would I end the movie in the way that it was supposed to be ended that when you're, when you're watching it. So, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know, like I said, it's always about trying to show somebody or trying to show an audience something different that they've never seen before and had that movie not ended that way. Well, we've seen that movie. Yeah. It, it, you, 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 you've been uh, saying a lot on how, you don't feel like you're an example to follow for young filmmakers, but listening to what you just said, I think that there is, this is, this uh, should actually inspire people. The fact that there are no rules in the well, way of story yes. to be told. Now, what I'm saying now could be inspirational to filmmakers, but not if you would have talked to me, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago or whatever, uh, because you know, no one should take that route. No one should take the route I took in, in that, in that amount of work. It was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. I could have learned all that shit from film school or something like that instead of making a hundred movies, but I was too stubborn to have done that. I have, a, you know, I have trouble paying attention and learning. I've got ADD. So it was like, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I had to do it that way. But someone who doesn't, someone who can learn, they should just go to film school and then, you know, start to then, then listen to me. Once you've already, you know, got all that, but don't learn it the way I learned it because I've wasted time. Yeah, you would do things differently if you yeah, could. For sure. And how do you feel now with the with the Mickey Reese collection being available on uh, on the Alamo Draft House? You know, I, I feel the same way I always do. I'm just it's always just me trying to get the next movie made. You know what I mean? So I'm always focused on that. So these the small victories like that and, and uh, the stuff with climate is all great. And, you know, getting to do cool interviews and stuff like that's great. But that's not really what I got into it for. I got into it to be on set, making the movie and to be editing. 
Um, and I'm not doing that right now. So the rest of the stuff is like, eh, this will do for now. But I really want to just get back on set. Which hopefully will be very soon. Hopefully. We'll but, see. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Well, that was... So, so I'm not like, like, there's, you know, there are these filmmakers that I've met along the way that'll just kind of make a movie and then live with it and live off it. Not, not live off it financially. I mean, just live off the, you know, just that we have a movie now. Yeah. Just live off that for a long time. I'm trying to get something, a, a project going while I'm editing the project before it, you know what I mean? Because you're still taking, taking like, you know, two, three months for pre-production. Well, I can do that and edit at the same time. I can do post on this one and free on this one at the same time. And um, so that's kind of always like my life, what I'm always focused on. So I think, you know, even if, you know, even if I get the opportunity to be a filmmaker that gets to make a movie every couple of years and gets to live off, you know, make a movie and live off that movie for a couple of years while you develop your next project, like, you know, like a P.T. Anderson or something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'll be able to sit still that long. Yeah. It seems to me that it's also a lot of free time. Right? It, yeah, what are you going to do in that time? Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I know it's hard to get a, a movie off the ground, and I'm sure even when you're Paul Thomas Anderson, it, it has to be difficult, but when you look sometimes at the gap between uh, the gap of years in a filmography, you're like, okay, what did they do for six years? Yeah, what's Todd Field doing right now, you know? Exactly. I mean, like in the bedroom and little children, what's he doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was Stanley Kubrick doing between Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shot? Yeah, we I want to see these damn movies. I want to see what, I want like, while you're living, make movies. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? That's, if that's what your job is, if that's what you're doing, just... Why stop? Keep going. Yeah. But may maybe there is the, maybe it's impossible for a lot, maybe a lot of filmmakers think it's impossible for them to work out of the system once you've entered it. That you cannot just jump between two sides all the time because uh, that would, that could make future productions more difficult. Yeah. I mean, and that's where, you know, what we were talking about Soderbergh earlier, like that's mm -hmm. where I definitely admire him where he can just, He'll just make whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely more along the lines of that or like a Woody Allen or something. Only in, only in film. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, about that, you were talking about making uh, a Michael Jackson film, and uh, I just put on for two seconds my uh, investor hat, and when you said that it's a film that couldn't be made, you, br you said you brought up the budget restrictions, but I was more about the the story restrictions because uh no satire yeah okay i see. think about it snl every saturday you know south park you know like so many should they do it all the time yeah like yeah you, can, you know tarantino did it once upon a yeah. time in Hollywood. you think he got permission from bruce lee didn't have to didn't have to get permission from bruce lee's family because it's it's satire you know what i mean it's just like a saturday night live skit yeah but that's how the jackson movie would be you don't have to use their music no, it's true. Yeah, yeah. It could actually even be more interesting if there was just none of Michael Jackson music in a film about him. That, that yeah, one hundred percent. That's yeah. and we didn't use any Elvis music in in the Elvis movie. Have you tried getting the rights for? I wouldn't. Know. I tried to get it, dude. I tried to get the rights for a song by Blue Cheer. You know, Blue Cheer is like Blue Cheer. So, well, I mean, they're not. They're Blue Cheer. They're not huge. You know, I mean, they're huge, they're iconic, but I mean, they're not like fucking, it shouldn't be that expensive. It was like something ridiculous. I mean, I'm sure I didn't go to the right music supervisor, but I mean, it was like 30 grand, 50 grand, something just unbelievable. <laughs> like, that's like the budget of the fucking movie. So I'm not, I'm not trying to get music anymore. It just pisses me off every time. Yeah, it's insane. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. P Peter told me how you 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 can't release your Star Wars movie because of the the music rights. Oh well, also it's just not good. <laughs> if I had that on on a link, I'd send it to you. It's just on like a DVD. Peter was at my house in January, so he got to see a bunch of stuff that was just like laying around on DVDs. Um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, no, I wouldn't release that movie anyway. It was trash. So, so are are you gonna like keep some movies hidden, like the early ones, or like I, I didn't get to watch Identity yet, but uh, you said only <laughs> ten. Per- I mean, if there's a, I'm oh, sorry, if there's a demand for them, like sure, I'll release them. But I mean, there's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe one last question, because uh, this this went very quickly. That was a nice chat. Uh, what is your opinion right now on the the future of the film industry? Uh, with it was already a mess before uh, before the COVID happened, but now uh, everything seems to be put on hold and everything needs to be uh, retaught. It won't. It doesn't benefit my livelihood to. Um, think anything to not be optimistic about it. Um, I don't want theaters to go away. I don't think they will. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I just, yeah, I really, I, I don't like streaming. Of course, I don't like streaming. Of course, I mean, I, I like, I mean, I like. Netflix as much as the next person or Hulu or any of the streaming sites or watching movies at home. I like it just as much as the next guy. Sure. But I love watching them in the theater. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just hope that that doesn't become obsolete. Um, Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I hope it doesn't, I don't know, like climbing to the hunter, you know, we really pressed for a theatrical release. And so, and that's happening in December. Right. Uh, but does anybody, is anybody going to be there? You know what I mean? Yeah. So that sucks, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I just, you would ask me next year. All right. You know what I mean? I just don't, I don't know enough. I'm not informed about it enough. I don't I'm not sure what, what's going to happen and what, you know, what's going to come of all, come of all this, but you know, I hope it's for the better. I hope it's not, or I hope it just goes back to be the same, whatever, whatever mess we were in before is not as bad as the mess we're in now. Um, you know, and I say this, like, it sucks, you know, like the Irishman had to go to Netflix and, you know, like that all the directors I, I love that are making movies or, you know, releasing stuff straight to VOD um, but at least they're still getting to make movies. Yeah. So it could be worse. You know, no one could want their movies at all. You know, like, uh, I haven't seen a Todd Salon's movie in a long time. I wonder what he's going to do next. Well, Netflix will probably, you know, put something out by him. Well, cool. I'll watch it and I'll be excited about it. Yep. Um, what was, didn't like Marriage Story was like straight to Netflix, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Yes. It that did. Was cool. I, I liked, you know, I, I want to see Noah Baumbach's movies. Yeah. So if I if I have to watch them on Netflix, well that's better than nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it right now. Uh we'll see. I'll probably I'm I'm probably not gonna be, you know, like a like a Tarantino or something that's just like, I'm retiring because we're not shooting movies on film anymore. Like I'll probably go with the flow, whatever, whatever happens, just because I want to continue making movies. Yeah, in the worst but case. My, my preference would be you know, releasing it in the theater, then it comes out on physical DVD or yeah. Blu-ray. Or something. Of course, that's my, <laughs> that's where I want life to be, but, you know, I'll, I'll go with whatever, I'll go with the flow, however. Yeah, and you know, about film production, worst case scenario, you can get back to your old basics and just grab uh, your camera with the mic on it and make films in your own house. Uh, maybe this is what everybody will have to do uh, in the near future. Yeah. Well, that'd be interesting. Then everybody's got a level playing field. Then it's all about ingenuity at that point. Absolutely. 